non-Muslim minorities are not denied their rights from the point of view of Islamic jurisprudence when they live among Muslim majorities. And as with all communities that are governed by the majority, while the law of the land may be predominantly guided by the Quran and the Sunnah in a Muslim society, Islam respects the rights of minorities to be governed by their own laws. And so even during the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, non-Muslims such as Jews were judged according to their own laws. So you do have a multiple type of legal system operating within an Islamic state. Many of the details of that agreement would be reached between the non-Muslim communities and the Muslims in what areas of the treaty agreement would they want uh, greater autonomy, in what areas were they comfortable with the position of Islam. When it came to rights of non-Muslims, as human beings, they had a right to live, they had a right to life, they had all their fundamental freedoms respected, as they are respected in any other society. The uh, killing of an innocent person, irrespective of their faith, the Qur'an describes as being a heinous crime, and the punishment of kisas, which is equitable retribution, uh, applies irrespective of the faith. That is, if the offense is not forgiven. It could be forgiven whether the um, perpetrator was a Muslim or a non-Muslim, or it could be punished. In fact, if a non-Muslim was murdered purely because he was a non-Muslim, then it is treated as a crime of hiraba, not even kisas. This is a state crime where the family cannot come to seek uh, forgiveness or uh, seek pardon because it's a crime against the state. It is the responsibility of the state to protect the non-Muslim. So Ibn Taymiyyah regards uh, killing of a non-Muslim just because he is a non-Muslim actually as a more serious crime than just an act of murder like killing a Muslim or a non-Muslim for the sake of business disagreements, etc. When it comes to the rights of non-Muslims, they are protected by their covenants and their agreements they have with the Muslim community, so much so that the Prophet ﷺ made it clear that a Muslim must stand in the shurutihim, must stand with their agreements and their, their covenants and treaties. Uh, and whatever alliances they've agreed upon, Muslims must respect that and must be fair. Muslims must be sensitive to the needs of non-Muslims. This is interestingly expressed during the time of Caliph Umar, when non-Muslims, just as Muslims would pay zakat uh, to the central te treasury, non-Muslims paid jizya, which was a poll tax, which usually was less than zakat to the central treasury. But because jizya was a pre-Islamic uh, practice of paying tribute to the more powerful or to the conqueror, if there was conquering. Um, traditionally, Arabs charged the jizya on non-Arabs. So when the Arab tribe of Banu Taglib, who were Christian Arabs, um, were told they would be paying jizya to the Muslim Arabs, they objected to this and asked Umar that how could they as Arabs be charged jizya by other Arabs? and they didn't want it to be called jizya, they were ready to pay zakat as Muslims paid zakat, and they were ready to double the amount, but they didn't want the humiliating uh, position of paying jizya. And Umar said, call it what you want, so long as you are contributing something. In other words, Umar's objection was not to humiliate people who did not need to be uh, subdued or, uh, or humiliated in any way. So when we look at the rights of non-Muslims, they have a right to their own honor, they have a right to their own freedom and religious practices, they have a right to their places of worship being protected, they have a right to their person, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, whoever usurps the right of a dhimmi, a dhimmi was a non-Muslim citizen, or a person who was under the protection of the Islamic State, that such a person would find the Prophet as his adversary on the Day of Judgment. The Prophet ﷺ says, whoever hurts within me, hurts me, and whoever hurts me, angers Allah. In other words, the Prophet was making it clear that injustice to 
non-Muslim citizens of Islamic State was unacceptable. When we look at the uh, non-Muslim who visits an Islamic State, who is a citizen of another state that is in peace treaty with Muslim uh, society, such people are called the Mu'ahid. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever kills a Mu'ahid will not smell the fragrance of Jannah even though it can be perceived from a distance of 40 years of traveling. In other words, such a person will be condemned uh, to hell since you're definitely not in Jannah and it's too far for you to even perceive its fragrance. So when we look again at the maqasid and the objectives of Sharia, of the respect to non-Muslims, the permissibility to even marry, there is no compulsion in religion. You cannot force Islamic laws on non-Muslims. You cannot require them to follow tenets of Sharia. And that is why they are even allowed to keep their faith, even if a Jewish or Christian woman was getting married to a Muslim man, for example. So Islam respects the right of autonomy for them to work as a community, to protect the society if they want to, but if they do not intend to play a part in the military role of defending the society, then they pay a jizya, which becomes like a military exemption tax. However, on the area of respecting rights of non-Muslims, just as you respect their right to worship, you respect their right to build, to maintain their places of worship, there is no prohibition in the Sharia, though some Muslims have claimed, but there is no prohibition in the words of the Prophet, peace be upon him, or in the Quran about prohibiting non-Muslims from building or maintaining their places of worship, their freedom of religion, just as we have freedom to practice and follow our own faith. Lakum dinukum waliyad deen. They have their faith and we have ours. Quran chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 120, is sometimes quoted as evidence why Muslims should not take Jews or people of the book as friends. The verse says, That the Jews and Christians will never be satisfied or pleased with you unless you follow their own way. If this interpretation is just to be taken out of its context and with disregard to the sabab nuzul the circumstances that is, when this verse was revealed, then people can come to interpretations that are wrong and misguided and that contradict other verses of the Quran and Hadith. To say Jews and Christians will never be satisfied with Muslims when we know of many Jews and Christians at the time of the Prophet and even today who have embraced Islam, they have been happy with the message of Islam, they have been pleased with Islam, tends to become a difficulty if one is to interpret this verse uh, without respect to the context. However, when we look at the Sabab al-Nuzul, Ibn Kathir, who is a respected commentator of the Qur'an, says that Qatada said that this verse was sent down, it was revealed in the context of a discussion the Prophet was having with some of the Ahl al-Kitab, people of earlier revelations, where they did not want to reach agreement. And the Prophet was being comforted by the verse and being told by Allah that these Jews and Christians will not be satisfied with you unless you follow their own ways. It would be wrong to interpret this verse out of its context and say that all Jews and all Christians will not be satisfied with Muslims or Islam. We do have many Jews and Christians who have been happy enough to have alliances with uh, Muslims and so Muslims have been allowed to treat them with goodness and with kindness. Uh, so this verse of the Quran should not be generalized to mean that Muslims should not be good because others will not be good towards us. That would contradict reality and that will contradict the teachings of other verses of the Quran and Hadith and its implementation in the life of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his companions.